Okay, I'm at a loss here. I'm not sure what to talk about in this little beginning part of the podcast. There's a number of things that are on my mind. First off, I've watched three more episodes of Daredevil since I last mentioned Daredevil. And I'm really enjoying it. I, I really am thinking now that the first two episodes just weren't that great. They impart some important information, but they just weren't that great. But after that, the series really picks up, and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I, I, I'm enjoying, I think, uh, Electra is good. I've heard some people with criticisms of her, but so far I don't see anything that that makes me think twice or makes me think that, that uh, she shouldn't be there, that the actress playing the part isn't doing a good job. I think she fits in very well, and I, I'm enjoying the series. Uh, I'm enjoying what they've been doing with The Punisher as well, and I can't wait to see how everything plays out through the rest of the season. So I'm about halfway through at this point. I've, I'm still watching Legends of Tomorrow. I don't know if I've I've watched a couple more episodes. I'm still enjoying it. And I've started to watch season two of Arrow. And I think it starts a little slow. And may, Or maybe it was the second episode that I wasn't crazy. I think it might have been the second episode, but it's starting to pick up. I'm, like I said, I'm three episodes in. And the other show that I'm watching, and this one I hope to do an episode on, is I'm watching the first season of the Teen Titans cartoon, which probably for some people isn't their cup of tea. Uh, I like it. I mean, it's kind of silly, and it's it's definitely aimed at a younger audience. But I think that it is done... They really capture some things in there, which... Some things which I remember from the... I don't know, it's the characterizations, and it's those sorts of things. And I don't want to get into too much, because I want to save this for... The, for, for an episode that I'll do at some point down the road, not too far. But I'll probably do an episode just on season one. I don't know if I'll do a big focus on any one episode, but there's lots of things running through this season that, uh, that, are, that, are, that I'm really enjoying. Dave Talks Comics, episode 111, Astro City, part one. Welcome to Dave Talks Comics, the programs where I talk about comic books I have read, cartoons I have watched, and comic book conventions to which I've gone. All past episodes can be streamed or downloaded from the program's website, davetalkscomics.com. On this episode, I'm going to be talking about Astro City, which is also known as Kurt Busiek's Astro City. This is the 1995 miniseries which ran for six issues. This is the original series of Astro City. It was originally published by Image. I think the reprints may have been handled by DC at some point, but the the original series, and I believe the subsequent series, was also published by Image. The trade paperback collection of these six issues won the Eisner Award in 1997 for Best Graphic Album Reprint. And this was my first time reading any of Astro City. And this is, it's not, although it's a six-issue series, it's basically six one-shots, which introduce the world of Astro City and some of the people who populate it. I found that uh, four of the six issues I thought were great, and I'm probably going to focus on them more than the other two. The other two just left me... I, I, they really didn't connect with me all that well. I, I'm not saying that they were bad comics. They just they just seemed like something completely different than the other four issues. I will, of course, be talking about what happened in the comics, the uh, summarizing what happened in the comics, and giving my opinion and my insights into that 
And through those things, there, there are definitely going to be some spoilers, so just please keep that in mind before you listen. The first issue of Astro City, or Kurt Busiek's Astro City, is titled In Dreams. And the writer is Kurt Busiek, the artist is Brent Anderson, and the covers are all done by Alex Ross. This issue focuses on Samaritan, who's also known as Asa Martin. He is a Superman-like character, both in terms of his personality, his, his generosity, those sorts of attributes, and also his powers, although it's not, he's not identical to Superman. He definitely seems to have some powers that Superman doesn't, and, and probably isn't supposed to be as invulnerable, but though I'm not really quite clear on exactly what his power set is at this point. The story, which is narrated by Samaritan, follows him on a typical day. He is shown in both his superhero and his civilian identities. So you get a heavy dose of him flying around the world, saving various people. And you also get to see him in his, in his, uh, his day job, I guess. Um, and he, he flies very fast, and so he, he's able to zip out of the office kind of the way that Clark Kent would sometimes is shown to do so in in Superman comic books and in other places, TV shows, movies, etc. On the whole, he seems very human. Samaritan seems very human and relatable. And I got a real sense of the burden he experiences of being a hero. Uh, not that he complains about it. Because he, he, he doesn't complain about it, but it's just kind of implicit there in the way he talks about things. You, I, I really got this sense of the weariness that he feels. I mean, on the, on the one hand, I think he, he, he really does enjoy helping others. And on the other hand, you definitely get the sense that it, it takes something out of him doing all this. And the story, with, with, there's a few things I found were very beautiful about this issue. That, that really spoke to me, and some of them are, are right there, right on the first few pages, and really just pulled me in. And the way the story opens and closes, the story opens with him getting awakened from a dream, a dream in which he's flying. And, I mean, that's the, the title of the story is In Dreams, and the story, the, the, the first page, which is a splash page, he's saying, In Dreams, In My Dreams... I fly. And you see him flying. And it's not that he's flying somewhere to save somebody. He's just flying. And it's, it's freedom. It's freedom. That's what he's experiencing there. And then an alarm goes off and he wakes up. And he has to go out and save people. He has to go to the office and work at the office. And, and it's not like it's just, there's, there's just one story here of him saving people. It's him constantly saving people. And then the story closes with him returning to bed, returning to sleep, and returning to the same dream that he was having that morning of him flying, of him being free, free of, of, of all these, of the burdens, of, of the, the responsibilities, maybe would be a better way to put it, of the responsibilities of helping others, of being able to use his abilities to to enjoy himself, and, um, I mean, he, he certainly takes up, I get the sense that he takes up these responsibilities freely. He isn't pushed into this. But at the same time, it's something that he, I don't want to say he dreads it, but it, it definitely weighs on him, it definitely weighs on him, and you definitely get the sense that somewhere in his brain he wishes it were a little different. He wishes that he didn't, the world wasn't quite as bad as it is or doesn't have as much potential for bad as it does. In this issue, you also get to see the, the analog for what I would, the Avengers or the Justice League, which in this case is called the Honor Guard. Um, and the other thing that I, I wanted to say about him is that there's this great moment in the story, somewhere about halfway through the issue, where he's he's saving a cat 
that belongs to a little girl, and he slows down to, because he could have just dropped the cat off very quickly, but he slows down so that the girl can see him. And he says to himself, and it almost costs a man in Boston his life. And so there's that responsibility that he, he's trying to do all these different things. He's trying to be so many different things to so many people. Well, maybe it's the same thing to all these people to be a hero. But at the same time, by trying to do so much, at some point, it becomes dangerous. And then on the next page, he admits that he can't save everyone. He says, I can't save everybody. People die even while I'm saving lives here but I can still do what I can. And it's, I think it's great that you got that because that's not something that you usually get in like DC or Marvel comics. I mean, you may see death in those comics, but you don't see the heroes admitting to the fact that they can't do it all. Not, I, I, it probably happens. It probably happens. But Superman admitting to that? I mean, I think it's kind of rare that that would happen or, or somebody on his level. So this comic book, this issue, I believe, is available for free on Comixology, which is how I got all six of these issues. And I highly recommend reading at least this one, although I've got to warn you that if you, if you really like this one, you may want to read more. So, um, but totally worth it. Totally worth it. The second of these one-shots, issue two, is called The Scoop. Once again, written by Kurt Busiek with art by Brent Anderson and a cover by Alex Ross. This one is cover dated September of 1995. The main character in this case is not a superhero, but a newspaper reporter named Elliot Mills. Well, a former newspaper reporter, now he's an editor for the Astro City Rocket. And the bulk of this story is a flashback in which he tells a story when he was from his early days as a reporter that took place in 1959, which I guess would be about 35 years before this comic book came out. The story that he tells, well, the, sto- the way it opens is he, he talks about witnessing a crime, a bank robbery, that was broken up by the silver agent, a superhero who I want to say is kind of like Batman, but they really don't give you enough here to know. If he, but certainly some of the bravado he shows seems reminds me of Batman a bit. Anyhow, Mills witnesses this the, uh, this the Silver Agent breaking up this bank robbery, and he's all ready to report it, but there's another reporter, a senior reporter on the scene, and the senior reporter gets to be the one to write the story. So... Mills walks around bummed out about this for for a day or so, but a couple nights later, he he sees somebody going into a closed subway station, and he he follows them secretly, uh, with, without them realizing it. These are some mysterious cloaked men, and. It turns out these guys are worshippers of Shirak the Devourer, who is the shark god. And he transforms these, these uh, cloaked men into shark men. Then the silver agent shows up with the rest of the honor guard, and, and Mills is still around, and he witnesses this battle between the honor guard and the shark cult. The honor guard, of course, is kind of like the Justice League of this world, of, of Astro City. After, and this all takes place, not only does he witness this battle, but that all of them get transported to this other dimension, and eventually they, they, they come back, they, they make their way back, but, so this, this battle takes place, and Mills writes up the story for the rocket, but it ends up getting sent back for rewrite multiple times, because all that he has is his own memory of the event. And his editor keeps telling him, you've got to stick with facts that can be verified. And he doesn't know how to contact the honor guard, and he can't find any other witnesses to corroborate the facts that he knows to be true. So in the end, the story, the printed story is much sparser and much less colorful 
than what actually happened. And the headline reads, Trolley Delayed by Shark. Because the the shark cultists, the, these members of the shark cult had been using the, the a, a corpse, not a corpse, a, um, a body of a shark, of a dead shark, in, in order to summon Shirak the Devourer. And that's all that was left in the subway, and so that's all he had to report on. So it becomes a much shorter story than he originally wanted it to be. That's the basic gist of the story. There's a lot more details in this story as to who shows up, which members of the team show up. I'll get a little bit into that. But on the whole, I really love this story. I I probably liked it just a smidge more than the first issue, but they are both great stories, I thought. My opinion, of course. Uh, there's, there, there's this whole story within a story effect here where Mills is telling the story to a junior reporter just before they go to lunch. And so, so you've got this two levels of story going on there. Although the, the, the story that takes place in the present, the part of it that takes place in the present, is all, is just the bookends of the story. I, but the, the, some of the other things that I love about this is that, you know, once again you get these teases of the history of Astro City. And the way I, I thought about this, this is what I wrote down, was that it was kind of like looking down an alleyway and Something catches your eye. You know, you're just kind of walking by. You're not really focusing on the alleyway. And something catches your eye, but you can't quite bring it into focus. You don't see what it is, and when you turn, it's gone. And that's kind of what this felt like. I mean, there's there's really not enough there to really tell you a lot, but there's enough there to tease you to want more. Uh, one of the things that when the Silver Agent first appears on the scene... The uh, Mills describes him as the poor, doomed silver agent and says something about none of us knew what would happen just a few years later. And he doesn't say anything else about this. But I I love this because it's telling you that something's going to happen to the silver agent and it doesn't happen in this story, uh, whatever it is, but presumably he's going to get killed at some point. And I don't know if that's told in a future story, a future issue of Astro City. It certainly does not take place in this Six issue series. Another thing that I really liked was the introduction of the of another member of the honor guard named the old soldier, who to me looked part Uncle Sam and part Captain America. He's draped in the American flag, and uh, the 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 look in Mill's eyes when this guy shows up because the honor guard and and the shark men have been fighting and then all of a sudden the old soldier shows up and that kind of turns the tide in the battle because at first it 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 was either even or it wasn't going so great for the honor guard and then the old soldier shows up and that kind of changes things but the look in Mill's eyes and the way that Brent Anderson draws that and the way he talks about the his words that that, that Kurt Busiek writes about the the old soldier just wow you know there's just something about that that's really moved me you know and reminded me of people like Captain America people like Uncle Sam from the DC comics it just wow and then there was this once he gets back after this whole thing after the fight ends and uh, he 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 goes back and he he writes this up and he's he's his colleagues dispute it, his facts, because some of these things just don't jive. It's it's almost like people arguing over a comic book story in this case, because he talks about how the bouncing beatnik was there, and his friends are like, no, but the bouncing beatnik wasn't a member of the honor guard. He was too much of a loner. He he wouldn't hang out with the honor guard, and and the old soldier, the old soldier hadn't been seen for fifteen years since World War Two. And people thought he was dead at this point, so he couldn't have been there, you know. So they're they're disputing his facts, and and he's got nobody he can turn to because he doesn't know how to contact the honor guard, and 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 there's no other eyewitnesses. Um, so this is a this is a really great story. Just there's, there's one caveat, and that's and it's it's really not a caveat. It's about the story. There's nothing wrong with the story. It's just one thing. That when he when he writes up this story, they show him typing it out on a typewriter, and this is a very cliched way that you would see in movies and television shows back then. You know, way before computers, um, and even in 1995, computers weren't. I'm, I'm 
pretty sure computers were being used in a lot of probably big city newspapers, but they probably weren't being used. I mean, the internet wasn't really being used at that point. Uh, at least probably not by people in newspapers, not to a large degree, not to do research. I seriously doubt it. I, I don't know. But, I mean, I grew up in a time when computers were just being introduced, and we still had typewriters in the house. And I would type up my 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 papers for high school on on a typewriter. I think I, I started to, to type up some papers on a computer when I was in high school, but about halfway through high school in the mid 80s. But uh, but I, I always thought it was funny how you'd see people typing these things up on a typewriter, and I could never do that. I mean, you're going back and you're rewriting stuff, and it, it just doesn't work that way for me. But on the whole, this is, once again, a another great issue from the Astro City, from the original Astro City miniseries. The third issue of Astro City, Kurt Busick's Astro City, is called A Little Knowledge. Once again, written by Kurt Busick with art by Brent Anderson and then cover art by Alex Ross. This one is cover dated October 1995. This is one of the two issues that I really did not get enough from to satisfy me. Uh, it was a bit of a letdown after the first two issues, because after the first two issues, I was just soaring high. I was loving the series. This one, the focus is kind of on a small-time hood named Eyes, who also goes by the name of Andy Eisenstein, I believe. And But it also is about a superhero by the name of Jack in the Box, and Eyes accidentally discovers the secret identity of Jack in the Box. And at first he thinks that Jack in the Box saw him, because what, what happens is he sees Jackson, Jack in the Box changing out of his costume into his civilian identity. Then he runs into him on the street in his civilian identity. And he dreams of using this information to become rich and famous, but he can't figure out how to, and he can't handle the pressure of this secret knowing this. He keeps thinking every time he runs into this guy that Jack in the Box knows that he knows. Uh, but apparently he doesn't. But basically the, the issue ends with Andy leaving town because he can't deal with the pressure of the secret. He wants to go to people he knows, other other criminals, and get them to help him, but he fears that they'll just double-cross him and take all the money. So he he's kind of, uh, it's kind of, what is it? Paralysis by analysis? Something like that. He's just stuck because he doesn't know what to do. He knows he wants to do something with this information, but he doesn't know what to do. Anyhow, the story, a lot of it is in the way in which it is told, because it's it's told basically from his perspective. I don't know. I don't think it's really from his perspective, although you are following him. So I guess that would be third-person omniscient. Uh, because you you are seeing his thoughts, but he's not the one narrating the story, really. I don't think. I'd have to look at it again just to be certain of that. But there is a certain amount of information imparted about Jack in the Box, his personality, his history, his relationship with the police, his personal life, but there's not enough of any of them to fully flesh him out. Uh, but there is enough to pique my interest to know more. So, unfortunately, this is it. You know, for this issue, I really don't have anything else to say. I mean, the art is decent. Uh, the visual storytelling is good. Uh, I, I just, it just didn't, it didn't work for me in the same way that the other two did. And maybe the other two were just, the first two issues were just that good that th this was, it was just a big step down for me. fourth issue is called Safeguards, once again written by Kurt Busick with art by Brent Anderson and a cover by Alex Ross. This one is different and the same as another, as the first issue. The similarities are that the main character narrates it. The difference is that the main character is not a superhero. In this case, the main character is named Marta. 
and she is an accountant. She lives with her parents in Shadow Hill, but works in Center City, both neighborhoods. I believe they're both neighborhoods in in Astro City. Shadow Hill might be a, a suburb. I'm not entirely clear on that. But Shadow Hill is different from the rest of Astro City because it seems to be more affected or controlled by magical forces. You see creatures in the shadows early in the, well, at various points in this issue. You see creatures in the shadow just as the sun's coming up, kind of shrinking back, uh, trying to get away from the sun. There's a figure who she passes on her way to work called the Hanged Man. Who, who kind of floats in the, in, in the air and who she greets non-verbally each morning, it seems. So Marta works in, in Center City. She works for a, a big law firm, uh, but that's not where she, that's not where she lives. And so she goes through this, this commute every day. She takes the bus from Shadow Hill to Center City and there's a, a a mountain between Shadow Hill and Center City, Mount Kirby, I believe it's called. And the the bus driver gives her a little bit of flack. Well, he doesn't give her flack. Well, he does. He, he he you know he says something about I don't know how you could live over here. This place always gives me the creeps. And and this bus ride is a part of the story that I really like. I mean, it's only like the first four or five pages. But as somebody who rides public transportation and has ridden it for probably more than half of my life, maybe even more than three quarters of my life, uh, there was something about it. Even though I don't ride the bus as much as I used to, I ride the the train more frequently. There's still something about it that I can I can appreciate. Like I said, this story is all about Marta. It it doesn't have. There's a lot of things running through the story, but it, there isn't one plot that really runs through it. If there is a, the, the theme that runs through it, it's that Marta feels trapped and torn between the, the two worlds, between Shadow Hill and Astro City, or Center City. She has good memories of growing up in Shadow Hill, but she feels trapped there. She feels like a child. Uh, whereas in Astro City, she feels like a grown woman who has the freedom to move to do what she wants to do. She has arguments with her parents, whom she still lives with, about leaving Shadow Hill. Uh, they, her mother in particular, accuse her of wanting to abandon her roots. Uh, and she, on the other side, when she's in, similar to what she experienced with the bus driver, who she sees every day, and he's, I don't think he was being mean to her, I think he was just uh, maybe being a little insensitive, uh, similar to that, she also takes flack from some of her co-workers for living in such a rough and dangerous neighborhood. I mean, one of them says something to her about the vampires, and she says, well, yeah, there, there are vampires, but they're not that bad. Uh, and then at one point in the story, maybe about halfway in, an opportunity presents itself for her to move to Astro City. But in the end, she decides to stay in Shadow Hill and even goes as far as to quit her job and take another one in the neighbor in Shadow Hill, in the neighborhood where she lives. Uh, there's a number of superpowered beings that pass through this story, but this this is all about Marta and about Astro City. There there is a fight that occurs. You get little bits and pieces early in this issue about the fact that some supervillains have escaped from jail and for some reason they attack the building where Marta is working. It's not entirely clear. Her boss, or one of her, not her immediate boss, but one of the partners in this law firm where she works is is engaged to a superhero, one of the members of the first family, which I guess would be an equivalent of the the Fantastic Four or something along that. I mean, that's what I think of when I think here first family. But she she and and Marta idolizes her. She her her boss is very very um, understanding. Uh, her boss uh, Darcy Conroy is very understanding. Um, but in the end, she decides that I think what she sees after this attack, what Marta sees, is that. Astro City isn't quite as idyllic 
as as she thought it was. And while she loves it, she she starts to see the the similarities between Shadow Hill and Astro City. They each have their dangers. And having grown up in Shadow Hill, I think she understands Shadow Hill better and decides that's where she prefers to live. But it's her decision. It's her choice. She decides that. It's not that she's... I don't think she feels like she was backed into a corner, backed that, that, that somebody forced her to make this decision. And so the whole story is about her coming to this realization. And there's just... There's so many things going on in this. And it, it's all about her. And it's all about Astro City. And so this issue, I think, really really bears rereading. Um because there's so many little things in here. And I think some of them are hints to other things. Like I, on the most recent read through, I picked up on something. It's not much. And I don't know if it's en- enough to say anything about, but there's a little something in there about the silver agent. Uh, but it was something that I completely missed the first couple times that, that I read this issue. On the whole, I think that this is, this is a really great issue. I, I don't know if it'll speak to everyone the same way that it spoke to me. I think a lot of it has to do with city living and not necessarily that city living in the sense of going out at night and that kind of stuff. It's more of the day-to-day stuff of having a job in one neighborhood, living in another neighborhood, taking public transportation to get there, seeing the differences between the different neighborhoods. And I don't know, on that level, it, it really, I found it very moving and very, very Precious, I don't know. Very, it, it really spoke to me, and uh, so this is the third of the four issues from this six-issue series that that I really liked. Issue five of Astro City is called Reconnaissance. Once again, written by Kurt Busick, with art by Brent Anderson and a cover by Alex Ross. This one is called Reconnaissance because the main character is an alien who's disguised as a human who's performing reconnaissance possibly for a planned invasion of Earth. I I wasn't crazy about this issue. I really, uh, that's probably putting it mildly, I really didn't care for this issue too much. There are two main characters in here. The, The main character, the alien, who also narrates the story for the most part, and, well, I call this story The Fool and the Alien. And The Fool is a superhero named Cracker Jack. I, I kept hoping in this story, and the story kind of follows them around. They have a couple encounters. Turns out they're actually both living in the same boarding house, which gets burned down at one point in the story. I, I kept hoping for more for a character that I would like, but I really had trouble latching on to either the alien or the fool, Cracker Jack. I didn't, I mean, I don't think Cracker Jack is supposed to be a likable character. Maybe a humorous character. But honestly, he didn't do anything for me. In the end, the alien gives up on humanity after following Cracker Jack around for a night. He, he puts a tracking device on Cracker Jack when Cracker Jack inadvertently or unknowingly saves him from the burning building. I mean, Cracker Jack knows what he's doing, but he doesn't realize that it's an alien that he's saving. So, I don't know. I think this was supposed to be humorous. I think it was being played for comedy a bit, but it just, it didn't make me laugh or even really smile. It just left me kind of scratching my head. It just didn't connect with me. And I, I, Obviously, if all of these issues in this miniseries were like this, I wouldn't be recording an episode about this, but I I feel the need to mention, at least give some idea of what this issue was about, since I I did enjoy two-thirds of this miniseries. Uh, Unfortunately, this wasn't one of the stories that I enjoyed. The final chapter, the final issue in this series is number six, which is called Dinner at Eight. And once again, finally, the writer is Kurt Busick and the artist is Brent Anderson and the cover is by Alex Ross. This 
This issue is basically, it's about a, a blind date. Well, a date. It's not really a blind date, but they've been set up. Samaritan and Winged Victory have been set up on a date. And as I said before, Samaritan is a bit like Superman, and Winged Victory is a bit like the Astro City's version of Wonder Woman. Her power set isn't exactly the same. She has wings, but there's definitely something that's reminiscent of Wonder Woman in her. Probably more than one thing. But they've been set up by their teammates of the Honor Guard. And actually, I'm not sure if that's exactly correct, because I'm not sure if she's on the Honor Guard, because I think she says something in here that I only picked up on this last time, that about not being part of the Honor Guard. Although maybe she fights alongside them sometimes. So they've been set up on a date. He he narrates this. Samaritan narrates this. Although it's it's not constant narration. There's a lot of scenes with them talking to one another. But every once in a while, you'll get a little bit of narration from him, usually not more than a sentence or so, and a short sentence at that. So he's very nervous about this, and she's a bit nervous. She admits to being a bit nervous about that, too, about it, too. She, Both of them are much more comfortable, it seems, being superheroes than being civilians. So they try going out to a restaurant in costume, but that doesn't work out because they end up being a big distraction to uh, the people around them. They have the mayor comes up and wants an autograph, then a senator, and it's not necessarily them who's asking for the autograph, but somebody, they're, you know, a waiter is being sent up wanting the autograph. And so they finish, they basically only have a drink, they don't have a meal, and then they take off. They, they change into civilian clothes. And they wind up at a burger joint called Beefy Bob's. And I'd love to know if this is some sort of inside joke. (laughs) I've never heard of Beefy Bob's before. And actually, you know, I mean, usually they come up with some made-up names for these sorts of places. But So they talk about things. They talk about their private lives a bit, although neither of them has much of one. He, he works all the time in his civilian or superhero identity, basically. He's working at one or the other. And she spends most of her time in her superhero identity. And even though when she, even when she's not out saving people or fighting crime as a superhero, she's helping to run uh, schools for women, which she helped establish because, well, she doesn't like the idea of women being dependent on men, and this is something that comes out. And and then even once she became a superhero, she didn't like the idea of women looking to her for protection. She wanted women to look inward. And I think the way she puts it is that women need to focus on their strength, on strength and not on weakness. And they they argue a bit over her bias towards saving women. And at one point he actually asks her, he says something about her having a... Let me see if I can find this. Her having a a a bias towards towards women, towards saving women, and and he basically says, you know, look, if there was a man and a woman, which one would you save? And, he, and she'd say, It'd be the woman, you know. Um, he 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 his from his he says <laughs> he talks about the need for perspective, but she doesn't want to. She doesn't like that approach. She just wants to keep forging ahead, forging forward, and she doesn't like looking at the big picture. She doesn't feel that she can handle the big picture. She's got her approach. She's got her her view of the world, um, her, pers- her perspective towards things, her take on things, and she... I guess she doesn't feel like she can step back and take a look at everything. She wants to focus on women's issues. And in the midst of all this, you also get his origin of how he came, uh, and this was something that wasn't clear before, but how he came from the future to change the past. He traveled back in time. He was sent by the people from the time period in which he came. And I don't think they're very specific about which, I think, maybe, was it the 25th century? I'm not sure. Maybe it was a 2,500 years into the future. Anyhow, 
he came back into the past and he his mission was to prevent was to save the Challenger space shuttle which crashed which exploded and crashed in 1980 January of 1986 and he does achieve that now his his superpowers apparently come from this trip into the past there's something with these energy field and and that gives him these energy based powers but so he comes from the past and so in the world of Astro City the challenger while there was an explosion he was able to save the astronauts on the challenger although he doesn't know exactly why that was considered to be so important so vital and but in the process of doing that he has changed the future the world from which he came and i i think originally it was basically a one way trip anyway but he he can't go back because the world that he came from doesn't exist and he even talks about how at one point in one of his adventures he wound up in the future again but everything was different his family wasn't there and he doesn't completely understand how he can exist if his family doesn't exist the apartment that he lived in is now a a taco place or something like that but um so so they 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 argue over stuff over their approaches to being superheroes which is kind of interesting because this is kind of like superman and wonder woman arguing about things except for superman and wonder woman probably in most circumstances wouldn't be arguing um so they in the end there's there they have a brief moment of peace and they share a kiss but then the moment is broken and 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 they they both streak off in separate directions to save lives or to um catch criminals um and that's basically the end of this of this issue and that's the end of the series Um I I think it's an excellent end to the series. I I I enjoyed both sides of the story and and the glimpse into the world of Astro City. It's just so neat. Oh, and one of the things that's going on in this issue that I thought was really cool was that you keep getting these glimpses of things because they're both thinking about the others their 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 peers the other superheroes out there who are out there fighting crime who specifically told them to go on this date they don't want them to be fighting crime tonight or at least not until the date's over and so they keep you you keep on getting and the thing is that Samaritan has this piece in his ear which tells him what's going on and winged victory has has some mystical Uh, amulet which also gives her some insight into things that are going on and so they're never completely at peace they're both inundated with messages telling them that something is going on and so it's it's kind of you know it's a constant buzzing in their ear they 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 just can't put down the superheroing they they have to keep doing it so like i said i i just i i love the clash of Samaritan and Wing Victory. Um they definitely argue in this issue. And I I really like the the variety of ways that the clash was framed. Their differing world views, their perspectives on themselves, how and why they are superheroes. And like I said before, this is just it's a great ending. So, on the whole, four of these six issues I think are very much worth reading. The other two issues You know, it's possible that they will build to something, but issues 1, 2, 4 and 6 I think are great. Third and the fifth issue, I'm not that taken by. But if if you have the opportunity to pick up this collection or pick up those four issues, I'd say definitely worth it. And I I'm really happy I read this. I kind of wish I had read this before because it's it's a really good series. couple final thoughts about this Astro City mini series. First is that as I listened back to what I'd recorded, I I noticed something that uh, Samaritan's alter ego or his his civilian identity Asa Mar- Asa Martin 
it's an anagram for Samaritan. I don't, I don't know why I didn't see that before. I wrote his name down several times. I wrote down Asa Martin probably a few times. But it, was, it wasn't until I was actually listening back to it, to what I had recorded, that I noticed that Asa Martin and Samaritan are anagrams of one another. And for that matter, Shirak, the Shirak the Devourer, the, the shark god, uh, is also an anagram for I Shark. <laughs> I don't know if that's intentional or not, but I, I thought it was worth pointing out. And the other thing that I wanted to say was about the, the final issue that one thing that I, I didn't address, and I didn't really think about it until after I'd recorded, but there, and, and this is something which is not in, is not mentioned in the book, I don't think. And that is that there's definitely a sense of loneliness, I think, that at the very least Samaritan, I think, experiences. And I'm not sure if Winged Victory does or not, but I, I think that Samaritan must. I mean, he's somebody... He's a man out of time. He's a man who's from the future, who can ne- never return to the world from which he came. The time he can return to the time from which he came, but the world has been changed. And I, I think he he must be he must be very lonely in in some respect. And I think he probably does he probably part of the reason why he he is so aggressive or not aggressive, but he is. He spends so much time in the doing the superhero thing is probably to keep his thoughts from wandering to other things, you know, to to the the world that he lost, and because nobody really can understand him, and I think that's part of the reason why he and Winged Victory were were pushed together in the way they were. I mean, it was their teammates who set them up on this date, and I, I've got to imagine to a degree that probably. Their teammates saw them, saw her also as needing a break, needing, because both of them seemed to spend a lot of time in their superhero identities, uh, her almost all of her time, and him most of his time, or a, a heavy portion of it. But the point being that they need something outside of that life. And I think that being, I think to a degree, they probably feel trapped. And they are certainly kindred spirits in that sense. Although I don't... I mean, it's certainly clear from this comic book that that they are not identical. They are not two peas in a pod. They definitely approach the world from different perspectives. And they have different goals in in being superheroes. But I still can't help but feel that they both, on some level, are probably lonely because because they spend so much time being superheroes and not enough cultivating relationships. And I don't know if this is something, I, I mean, this is probably something that they don't even consider, that they probably aren't even consciously aware of it, or even if they are consciously aware at some level, can they even admit to themselves, or is it something that they even would would think about? But it's definitely something which is not overt in the book. It's just something that I am reading into the book and something that I see there. It has been a couple days, well, no, actually, it's only been 24 hours since I recorded the previous bit that you just heard. And in that time, I have listened to everything I recorded again. And I also listened to another podcast about this run of comic books. It was a a podcast from several years ago, Back Issue Spotlight number 14, which was part of the Comic Book Page podcast. I found it through Comic Book DB. If you go to Comic Book DB, DB, dot com and look up any of the comics in this series there should be a link there to this this episode or i think if you just google back issue spotlight number 14 or back issue spotlight astro city you should probably find it i thought they did a pretty good job discussing it i certainly did not agree with them on everything 
And if you listen to that episode, you, you'll see that. I think there were some points of agreement and some points of of uh, divergence, let's say. Um, one interesting insight that I heard there that I didn't, a connection I didn't make was the old soldier who shows up in the second issue of this series. One of the people on the podcast compared him to the unknown soldier. And I can certainly see that now that I, I hear somebody say that, but it just, it didn't click in my head, which is a little disappointing since I, 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 I was a fan of The Unknown Soldier when I was much younger. I haven't read much of it recently. But the other thing that I wanted to say was I really didn't mention Brent Anderson very much other than to mention that he was the artist of these six issues. And I think he did a great job with this comic book, uh, both the, the visual storytelling and the way he depicts people, the way he draws people. Sometimes... I, I find that his art, when he's drawing things that are um, smaller at, at, from a distance, his art, there's something about it that seems like a little messy to me, but I, even though it, it looks a little messy, I really like the job he does. And of course, the, the number one thing, probably the first thing that I read that he did was the X-Men graphic novel, God Loves, Man Killed, which is still one of my favorite X-Men stories. I, I have plans to continue reading Astro City. I'm not sure. I, I have called this episode part one, but uh, and there's certainly more of Astro City that I can read, but I'm not sure how soon, how how long it will be before I get back to Astro City. But obviously, the next installment to read would be to start reading the I believe it's 22 issue series that came out starting the in the following year. That's it for episode 111 of Dave Talks Comics. Dave Talks Comics can be found on the internet at davetalkscomics.com and facebook.com slash davetalkscomics. On Twitter, at davetalkscomics. Email can be sent to davetalkscomics at gmail.com. I'm Dave. Thank you for listening.